Hey everybody, as usual, I have to adjust the mic. Yeah, it's kind of floppy. There we go. All right. Uh, so I picked this, and I can't remember, yeah. Uh, I picked this costume because it has a UT uh, tie to it. I was a, an undergraduate here at UT some <clears throat> time ago. And uh, this is me in Littlefield dorm with my sister, and uh, I'm dressed as an American tourist. So, <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking to you about using the Hubble Space Telescope to understand the likelihood of finding life around red dwarf planets. It's a lot of fun to talk about this because last time I was at Astronomy on TAP it was a couple of years ago, and I talked to you about building an instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope. And so now I'm actually going to be able to talk to you about using that instrument to do science, and that's pretty exciting for anybody who does instrument development for a living. Uh, so the very first question will be, what is a red dwarf? And if you're a nerd of a certain age like me, then you might think I'm talking about these guys. Uh, and you wouldn't be wrong, but not tonight. Uh, tonight, instead, I'm going to talk about red dwarfs that are stars. And these are the stars that are the lowest mass of end of what we call the main sequence of stars. So stars that are actively burning hydrogen in their atmosphere come in a range of luminosities. Whoops luminosities, which is how much energy they're putting out, and temperatures. And so here's the sun with sort of a mid-range luminosity and size and a moderate temperature. And these guys down here at the low luminosity, low temperature end of the main sequence are red dwarfs. They're also known as M stars based on the uh, astronomy has a lot of historical names, and this is one of those. They used to be ranked in alphabetical order based on the characterization of certain spectral features you saw, but then once we realized that they were different temperatures and luminosities, they got rearranged, and here you have the sun is a G dwarf, and the M dwarfs are the ones down here, much smaller, and both smaller, less massive, and putting out less energy. Oops, wrong way. All right. Great, so you wanna to try to find life around other planets. Why don't you just start with a G dwarf? We know that life can form around a G dwarf like the sun, that's the one case where we know life is formed. So why are we talking about trying to find life around an M dwarf star? or a red dwarf. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of them. They actually dominate the population of stars. If you look around our local neighborhood in the galaxy, 75% of the stars are going to be red dwarfs. We also know from surveys like the Kepler survey that you heard about a bit in the last talk, um, that these are heavy in rocky planets. We know that these red dwarfs average something like two planets per star, and those are three and a half times more likely to be rocky than gas giant planets. So we, we know that these low mass stars are also rich in small rocky planets. And the last reason is it's easier to find an Earth-like planet. If you're trying to find something the size of the Earth, it's a lot easier if you're using, uh, I will get this by the end of the talk, uh, if you're using something like the transit method where you're watching the planet move in front of the star and see how much the light decreases, it's going to be much easier to see something the size of the Earth transiting in front of a small planet like TRAPPIST-1 that's a tenth the size of the uh, sun than it is going to be across the sun. You're just going to get a bigger, stronger signal. So it's going to be much simpler to actually find something the size of the Earth around something that's a lot smaller than our own sun. Uh, the other reason is the old joke about the guy who went looking for his keys under the lamppost because that was the easiest place to find them. This is going to be what we're going to be able to do in the next decade. We already have Tess, a uh, planet-finding um, machine that's currently found. It's, they just announced the first two planets that it's been able to find using this transit method. Uh, it's just been announced in the last few weeks. And eventually they're going to find something that looks like the size of the Earth 
uh, that's in a in a orbit around that planet that makes it possibility of it supporting life. And that's the type of system that the James Webb Space Telescope, once it launches, is going to be able to try to characterize. So for at least the next decade, if we're going to be looking for something like the Earth, where we hope there might be life, it's going to be around these red dwarf stars. So you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the future. Of course, then the next question becomes, can they support life? You know, we know around our own solar system one case where life is formed on some other tentative evidence of things like liquid water on Mars that may suggest that life formed at one point. Uh, but the way these planetary systems are going to look and the way the places you're going to be looking for life are going to be very different around these small stars. As I said before, they have a much lower luminosity. So we have a characterization of astronomy that we call the habitable zone, and that basically is the orbit around the planet where water can be in liquid form. The one thing we've seen by the diversity of life in, on the Earth and the places where we find it is that it's inextricably uh, correlated with the presence of water in liquid form. And so if you look at our solar system, the Earth is smack in the habitable zone, the liquid water zone. Venus is on the hot edge of that, and Mars uh, which we know had liquid water at one point, is also on the cool end of the habitable zone. If you now go to a system that's a half or a tenth the size of our solar system, these planets are going to move in. Uh, the habitable zone where you might find liquid water is going to move in much more closely. So that instead of looking for something that's orbiting around its star once per year, you're going to be looking for something that's orbiting around its star uh, once every few weeks or once every month or something like that, depending on the mass of the star that you're looking around. This is a great example. We've already found one system where there are three planets that may be in this habitable zone. This is TRAPPIST-1. It's a very small star. It's about point, it's 8% the mass of the sun. So this is extremely small, uh, still an active star, burning hydrogen, but quite, quite small relative to the sun. And we found seven rocky planets around this system. Three of those, these three here, are likely to be in the liquid water, the habitable zone around that star. So it's possible that those could support life. Now, take that entire system, all seven of these planets, and compare that to our solar system. That's it right there. It's well within the orbit of Mercury, and in fact, these habitable zone planets range from uh, one to about 14-day orbital period. So they go around every two weeks as opposed to once per year. The other implication of this, there's a lot of implications. The, there's a whole range of talks that we could give on what it means for the fact that you're going to have your planets sitting right up next to your star. Um, they're going to be tidally locked, like the moon and the earth, where there's a permanent day side and a permanent night side on the moon. That's probably the same thing you're going to see for these systems. They're going to have hot day side and night side, so the ability to sustain life may depend on how much you can circulate that heat uh, around the planet, planet's atmosphere. They're going to be tidal forces, just like the moon pulls on our uh, uh, oceans with tides, they're going to be very strong tidal forces. But the thing I'm going to talk about today is the effect of the star itself. This thing's sitting right up next to the star, and these red dwarfs are very active stars. They have a lot of energy that they put out in the X-ray and ultraviolet, and that has a really strong effect on the atmosphere of the planet, the likelihood that you're going to be able to form life in the first place, and then whether or not you're actually going to be able to keep that life going for long enough periods for co complex life to uh, form. Oddly enough, we didn't actually know very much about what these red dwarfs were doing uh, before the interest in exoplanets took off. There were some people who studied the X-ray and ultraviolet emission from these, mostly because they were interested in flares and magnetic field activity on the star. But just what a run-of-the-mill red dwarf is doing and how that affects its planet was something we didn't understand until recently. As a result, our team initiated a survey called MUSCLES. This is the, where the title of the talk came from. Measurements of the ultraviolet spectral characteristics of low-mass exoplanetary systems. I will take neither credit nor blame for that title. <laughs> That's from uh, the leader of the original survey, Kevin France. I'm leading the follow-on survey. And what we're doing is getting a representative sample of different types of red dwarfs, different ages, different masses, different activity levels, to try and understand how the 
high energy emission coming from these objects is going to affect the planets that are orbiting around them. Now I told you at the beginning of the talk that red dwarfs are much less luminous than the sun. They put out less energy. That's partially true. That's true about the surface emission. Uh, that's what we see in the infrared. That's what we see in visible light. That is much fainter, much less luminous for an M dwarf. But these are very active stars. And they have, just like our sun, active chromospheres and a hot stellar corona where you can get up to a million degrees. And on these low mass stars, that region, the really hot extended gas above the surface of the star can actually be stronger in the red dwarfs than it can be around the sun. So that's what we've been trying to do with our survey. We don't take pictures, we take spectra, and I'm showing you an example of a, a data product for one of our stars here. And what we're particularly trying to do is get X-ray data, which we use the Chandra and XMM observatories for, and ultraviolet data, and for that we use the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we can't directly observe the extreme ultraviolet, which is an extremely important uh, wavelength range for understanding how much the planets get heated. Uh, we have to infer that, for most cases, gas in our own Milky Way absorbs that light before it can reach our uh, telescopes. So, why do we care about the high energy light that's coming out of these red dwarfs? Well, as I said, there's a lot of it. These planets have, these red dwarfs have copious high energy emission, and if you plot how much of that EUV light, that extreme ultraviolet light, is actually hitting a planet in the habitable zone, you actually see something like 10 to 600 times more energy, high energy light, hitting that planet than you see around the sun from, uh, around the Earth from the sun. So the black line here shows you the EUV light that we actually see on Earth coming to us from the sun. And then here we've plotted several of our different targets from our survey to show that depending on the mass of the star and how old or young it is, you can actually be bathed in a significantly higher level of high energy flux from these stars than you would uh, around the earth, from, on the earth from the sun. What does that mean? Well, that heating can drive atmospheric escape. You can break apart molecules in the atmosphere, things like water can break apart into hydrogen and oxygen, and you can heat the hydrogen enough to actually drive it off the surface of the planet. So you might be left in a case for these red dwarfs where all you have is oxygen and nitrogen in your atmosphere. It's called an oxygen-dominated atmosphere. Even other people who have modeled these systems say that if you take into account ion escape, which just means that you can drag some of the heavier atoms along with the hydrogen, you might be left with a bare planet. So we find an Earth-like planet, something about the size of the Earth. It's in, a, in the habitable zone where liquid water could form. We're all excited. Let's point James Webb Space Telescope at it. And we see nothing because all that's left is a bare rocky planet. This is uh, an artist's rendition for Proxima Sen. Andy mentioned that in the previous talk. This is a planet that we think, a, star, a planet next to the closest star to us. Proxima is a very active star, and it's entirely possible that that planet is just bare rock. All right. Those models have a lot of knobs to turn. There are things I'm not even talking to you about when it comes to what's in the Earth's atmosphere at any moment. It's extremely complicated. Uh, cycle between material coming out of the interior of the Earth through volcanic activity and the atmosphere sinking into the oceans. It's extremely complicated. And you can run models for even for a really active system like Proxima and say, no, we're pretty sure we're going to hold on to an ocean. We can still form liquid water. We may be able to have life. Great. So now we're going to go and look for life. Well, these planets are not out of the woods yet because you have to worry about the effect of stellar flares. We all know that the sun flares and on occasion it can affect our telecommunications equipment and issues like that. It's much stronger for these red dwarfs and it lasts for a much longer period of time. The, uh, it can take several hundred million years for a, plant, for a star like the sun to turn on and become a regular star. It can take a billion years for the same process to happen with a red dwarf. And during that entire period the star is extremely active and it's flaring. I show you a couple examples here. 
Um, the instrument that we use on Hubble, the one that um, uh, my team and I built, Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, you can actually take time resolved data. You can watch what the star's doing over time and divide it up into energy bins. And what we find is that for all of our stars, even though they weren't considered to be flare stars, we didn't think they were very active based on what they were doing in the optical, invisible wavelengths, they all flared in the ultraviolet. And I have a couple examples here of what a flare looks like, where you're just going along and the star's putting out a certain amount of high energy flux and then boom, it turns on in a bunch of different lines. And by looking at the different ionization levels and the temperatures that those different um, components trace, Silicon that's been ionized three times, lost three electrons, traces hotter gas than carbon that's only lost one electron, for example. That's the kind of thing that allows you to tell which part of the chromosphere it's coming from. But what we found is they're all active. They're all going off regularly in the ultraviolet. Okay, what happens when you get a stellar flare? Again, you have a planet sitting right up next to the star and you get some massive flare coming off the planet, sending both particles and flux towards your planet. You can dissociate ozone. You break apart the ozone, you no longer have the ozone layer protecting the surface of the planet. Now that ozone can reform, it takes a, a decade or so, it's, but it's not terrible. However, what happens if you get another big flare in the meantime? Well, then your atmosphere is unprotected and there's nothing that can keep you from not being inundated with the next flare because the ozone isn't in place. And I uh, have a paper here from a colleague who modeled, again, a very large flare that they saw on, on, from Proxima Sin, where they determined how much ultraviolet light actually reaches the surface of, of a planet around Proxima, uh, and then what would happen during different types of flares, uh, and how much, uh, depending on how much ozone was left in the atmosphere after a previous flare. And what they found is you can actually get a potentially germicidal dose, by which they mean that they looked at some of the UV resistant bacteria and other things, uh, life forms on our own planet, and how much UV light can actually kill them, and they found that that large flare that they saw in Proxima would put enough UV light at the planet that they could potentially kill off any surface life. Okay, so does that mean we should stop talking about red dwarfs and wait a decade and come back when the next big thing's coming along? Well, it's not all bad news. First off, what breaks apart the ozone layer isn't the flare light, it's particles. When you have a really intense flare on the sun, you get charged particles that can break out of the magnetic field loops on the sun and stream toward the Earth. We haven't seen that around red dwarfs. We have not seen any evidence of these particles. We think they should be there if you just scale the magnetic field strength from the sun to the red dwarfs much stronger. It's something we should have detected and we didn't. It may be that the magnetic fields are strong enough on these red dwarfs, they actually trap those particles and they can't escape. If that happens, then your ozone layer is, remains in place and you're protecting the atmosphere. I haven't said anything about whether or not the planet has a magnetic field. Our Earth's magnetic field does a lot to protect us from particles in the solar wind, for example. The other thing is, I said, germicidal dosages for life on the surface of the planet. You can go down two feet into below water level and you're perfectly safe. So if life is forming in the ocean, if it's forming in a cave or in a hot vent around a volcano, then you might be able to survive. And the places that we find life on our planet are that diverse and more. So life is very fast to form and it's very persistent afterwards. So there may be uh, a lot of different ways in which life can form on these planets and then be protected from these types of effects. And the last thing I'll mention is I've talked to people who have been modeling how life formed on the early Earth, and some of them have come to me and said, we want the flares on the red dwarfs because the light from the surface of the red dwarf, as I said before, is not very luminous. It's not enough to drive some of the processes that they see uh, forming precursors, things like long sugar chain molecules and RNA. They need more ultraviolet light and they think these flares might actually provide some of the kickstart that you need for some of the early life formation. All right, so to finish up, 
uh, we're starting to look for signs of life in very unfamiliar places, and particularly around red dwarf stars. There's a lot of challenges for that life, but there's also a lot of potential. And as a stellar astronomer, what I would say is if you want to understand the planet, you have to know about its star as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, gentlewoman astronomer. We have some time for questions. Yes, right there. So that's actually something I had in this talk and had to take out for the interests of time. He's, he's asking about the possibility of false positives. And that's actually something we've found. People have taken the ultraviolet light that these stars put out and run through models of what type of atmosphere you might have around the planet. And you can actually get the production of ozone, which we consider a biomarker on our planet, without life on these M dwarfs for complicated photochemical reaction chains that I didn't have time to talk about. So that actually is a serious issue. And some of our, the theoretical members of our team have been modeling what type of signatures James Webb will need to look for if they want to at least have a rough idea that there could be life on these planets. And it's usually some combination of O2 and ozone plus um, methane, I think, or um, a couple other molecules that together are very hard to form without life forms on our planet. Young man, right here. So the question was about K stars, which are intermediate in mass um, and um, temperature from between our sun and the M stars. And we certainly can look there, but what I didn't say is the closer you get the planet, something the size of the Earth to the star, the easier it is to detect. So people have run models for how many Earth-sized rocky planets they're going to find, and all of them are not only around these red dwarfs, they're on the really low mass end of the red dwarfs. That's, so it's not even like the, the bigger, hotter red dwarfs. We're really going to have to go down to the ones like TRAPPIST-1 that are a tenth the mass of the sun. So people will certainly be looking around K-stars. It's just the statistics are going to be a lot easier the smaller the star is. Yeah, back there. So the question is, how do we see the, how do we figure out how much extreme ultraviolet light is coming from these systems? Um, there used to be an instrument called the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer. It flew in the um, 1980s, and you could observe about 20 stars other than the sun. So we have some data on a few stars, but mostly what we use are proxies based on the sun. So we're having, so there's a big fudge factor there because we're going from a sun to an, uh, a red dwarf, but we take the strength of hydrogen emission, what's called Lyman alpha, which is something we see in the far ultraviolet, and we use that based on observed proxies to scale that to the EUV light. There's also ways that we're going to be doing in the next iteration of the survey to do full models. So you can do end-to-end -end models from the photosphere, the surface of the star, up through the chromosphere and the corona. And if you have enough lines from different uh, spectral features that trace different um, temperature regions, you can actually model that from end-to-end, -end, and then you just get the extreme ultraviolet out of that automatically. We've done that for um, one or two stars, but it's pretty intensive computationally. Okay, and with that, let's thank Gentlewoman Astronomer again. Thanks, Cindy.